The lecture today will be focused on ORS in motivational interviewing. ORS is an acronym that stands for open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and summarizing, all of which are core communication skills for addiction counseling. These skills might feel familiar from previous coursework, and if they sound like reflect reflective listening skills, you're right. MI offers its own flavor to these skills, so today we're building off of previous information to get a feel for what this looks like in motivational interviewing. Engagement is a fundamental component to any counseling relationship. It is the process of establishing a mutually trusting and respectful helping relationship. With that being said, the rapport that we build in our therapeutic sessions will help to sustain the motivation to change over time. Having strong rapport, therapeutic alliance, and engagement will help us to reach the desired goals in a collaborative way. We're going to help recognize the importance and meaning of the significant change in the process of commitment to change. We'll do so from a lens that's strength-based and trauma-informed. Our expectations will be clear and will help guide individuals. We'll recognize that we are not the expert of their experience, but are willing to walk beside them in a non-judgmental way to help meet their goals and expectations, and all the while instill hope for a recovery process. Now I've built in our discussion questions throughout the slides today, so we're entering into our first discussion opportunity. So motivational interviewing says that engaging is more than just being friendly and nice to the client. What other aspects of engagement are important to you as an addiction counselor? Feel free to add a comment below. I'm interested to see what engagement really means to you. Active listening is a fundamental component to all counseling. What exactly is it that we're listening for? When we engage in active listening, we're really on the path of exploring verbal versus nonverbal communication. As we know, most communication is nonverbal, and I would encourage you to take a look at yourself in the mirror and run through a potentially challenging conversation that you would have in an addiction counseling session with a client. Take a look at your own nonverbals. Is it it's something that we don't get to see part of very often unless you're maybe doing video recordings of your sessions for supervision. However, clients see our nonverbals on an everyday basis. Being able to stay calm, wiping that judgmental look off your face, and being able to keep a cool tone will help our communication style. But we all have nonverbals that we're not necessarily familiar with. And again, because we don't see ourselves as often as everybody else sees us, try practicing in the mirror, just see what you can uncover. But when we're working with clients, we must help to explore what is being projected versus what is really going on. That's the congruency that we've been talking about. Like a client, if they're saying they're feeling happy, but they have a flat affect and a frown on their face, maybe a wrinkled brow, and maybe they're even on the verge of tears, that really tells you something when words and presentation don't match. That's the congruent or incongruent piece of the work that we must be really mindful in helping bring that to light. We're also going to explore what conscious or subconscious behavior is in the therapeutic session. For individuals coming to treatment, it's very common for them to share with us the conscious story, not necessarily their subconscious story for a number of reasons. They might be in denial. They might have been in trauma or a significant deficit that their body's protecting itself from the information that they're not prepared to discuss yet because they don't have the ability to cope well with it yet. People in our work will tend to confuse this conscious, subconscious, congruent, or incongruent behavior as a form of ambivalence or resistance or manipulation. When we look to do the work from an unconditional positive regard stance where we're non-judgmental with individuals, we must recognize that this behavior may not be resistant or manipulative. It may truly just be that the person's truth in their moment is showing and what they're able to share with us, they're sharing. We will continue to engage and be supportive to help guide them through these processes of self-exploration. And this idea of self-image versus self-idea, self-ideal. Who do I want to be and who am I? Am I broken? Is there shame? Is there guilt? Am I feeling guilty for doing something or am I ashamed of something that I've done? And how does that affect my ideal self? How do I learn to heal and recover from some of my experiences? We are here to help people understand that there is potential and hope. They can engage in better, more informed thinking, a more rational thought process that will lead to behavior modification that will help them to achieve the goals that they are looking to achieve. Listening is a part of a change process. Gestalt therapy says every story has a beginning, middle, and end. 
Individuals will have strengths in one particular area of beginning, middle, or end, and it's really rare that you'll find any individual having a strength in all three areas. Again, with situations, this might change. If you're an individual who's very strong in the beginning, you're able to make relationships quickly and do that really well, but sustaining the relationship through challenging times or being able to have a true closure to a relationship might not be your strong suit. And you can see how it might flux based on adapting needs, styles, and experiences. For us as counselors, we have a great opportunity to be not only a role model for all of these areas, beginnings, middles, and ends, but can also help individuals to explore where their strength and growth edges lie. We can help to understand some connections, themes, and patterns, and ways of behaving, ways of thinking, all of which might have stemmed from schema or attachment style development, which impacts view of self, others in the world, and how we relate to others. So in doing so, we have this great opportunity to make a hypothesis of what is happening for an individual based on what they're sharing, what we can see, what we're assessing, and ultimately what their long-term goal is, and how do we engage in the mapping process to help connect and pull this together in a way that's meaningful and intentional. Individuals who come into addiction treatment often struggle to identify their resources, strengths, assets, or abilities. At the agency I work at, our intake interview has a section that asks clients to identify their strengths and weaknesses. More often than not, clients tend to struggle with identifying any strength and are more prone to being well attuned to their weaknesses. So here's a great opportunity to engage, evoke change, and be very strength-based. Listening for what's not being said for individuals who come into treatment, whether they're externally or internally motivated, is the fact that they've walked through the door. There's a very vulnerable time for anybody that says, I'm seeking help in some way, shape, or form. So how do we help them recognize that being vulnerable, in fact, is a strength? Asking for help is a strength. That the commitment to be present in the office today and devote time to their own safety and well-being is, in fact, a strength. What do we do to look at resources outside of them? What's the recovery environment like? What other ancillary supports do they have that are healthy and productive and match their goals? Also, how do we look at high-risk people, places, and things and look to develop skills in coping strategies to combat high-risk activities and involvement with the high-risk people and ultimately endorse a sense of safety and well-being? And then ORs and motivational interviewing. Think of ORs and motivational interviewing like actual ORs, like the paddles of communication skills that you'll use to navigate the vast sea of each client. You know I love a good metaphor. You know, just close your eyes and imagine you're in a rowboat, canoe, kayak with your client, maybe a stand-up paddleboard, whatever floats your boat. Who's in charge? Who decides where to go and how quickly to get there? Is the water smooth or choppy? Is anybody rocking the boat? Put yourself there and think about using your oars for movement to engage and evoke change. We use open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and summarization. And here's another discussion opportunity for today. Evoking is said to be the heart of motivational interviewing. How are the core interviewing skills, oars, used in evoking? And we're going to talk about each of those ors in a second. So open-ended questions, affirming, reflecting, and summarizing. So first up, we have open-ended questions. Open-ended questions are extremely important to the work that we do. And an open-ended question is like, how have you been today versus did you have a good day? And you can see the response evokes something different in how we're communicating with one another. How have you been today evokes a string of possible responses with deep nuanced meaning versus did you have a good day usually elicits a yes or no response with not much content to work with. So being mindful of engaging in open-ended questioning is very beneficial to our work. And it also, it helps us to keep from leading individuals in a direction that we intend them to go. Open-ended questions allow for more self-directed guidance and for us to partner with individuals throughout the therapeutic process. Open-ended questions evokes curiosity as an invitation to a larger conversation. It opens a door, but it does not determine the path or the direction that the client will take. We want to keep it simple with open-ended questions. We can always reflect their response back to them to ensure that we're understanding and to tell the individual, I hear you, I see you, I can make sense of what's happening right now and work with you in that area. We want to avoid asking multiple choice questions, rhetorical questions, or a series of questions. This can all be very confusing, and it can be frustrating for individuals and often is a result of countertransference. 
if any of these things are coming up for the counselor, it might tell us that the counselor is trying to be 10 steps ahead of the individual and in thinking about a response versus allowing the client to be the expert in the room and allowing them to guide. It might tell us that the counselor is starting to experience or be triggered by something that's occurring in the room. So please be mindful of how you can be grounded and engage in a therapeutic process that keeps you safe and keeps the client safe and allows the client to be the expert in the room. With affirming, we want to accentuate the positives and help to recognize positive change and positive talk. We want to acknowledge situations that come up in the moment where we can redirect and say, wow, in the past you said that you struggled with this, but I'm hearing something very different from you today. I'm wondering if you noticed that too. How do we offer support with strong, healthy boundaries and be able to clarify our roles and explore this exploration of true self in an encouraging and inviting way? Being very genuine as a person to develop a strong therapeutic alliance will sustain over time and offer hope and instill optimism to individuals. We're affirming that change is possible, and the fact that they're seeking support today is very meaningful to help guide them in these next steps. Strengths, abilities, and supports. Again, we want to help pull from them and help elicit that information, even though individuals might not recognize their own strengths, abilities, and supports in the moment. Reflection. As far as reflection is concerned, we want to talk about how we listen, what we're listening for, and the response. So how are we listening? Think back to congruent or incongruent behavior, conscious and subconscious. We want to be able to identify, clarify, and offer goal setting in what we're listening for. We want to make sure that we understand what the client says and how they're saying it. So reflecting back to them what's being said can be very significant. It will help us to match and pair in a correct way, or it'll help us to say, maybe Maybe I missed the mark here and I'm curious to better understand what's happening or maybe help the client in their own words in a more connected way. So as far as the response, we can then start to identify more clearly, validate and infirm with responses that evoke change and help us to look for the client's own skill sets and coping strategies that they have and how they might be applied to continue to grow from there in their recovery process. By using reflections, we help to eliminate defensiveness. It's also a way to guide the counselor in not making assumptions. Additionally, it continues to explore self and that ideal self. And summarizing. Summarizing will help us determine what to reflect and summarize. So ultimately, how do we take all of this information and reflect it back in a way that's meaningful and really engage in the sense of, I see you, I'm with you, I hear you. We're collecting that data and we're really making it an accumulative summary of the interrelated events and themes. And we're starting to connect the dots. We're starting to look for puzzle pieces and putting them together to make a larger sense of the story. We're linking the summary to the here and now and the there and then. So what's the connection based on activating events and experiences, this view of self and others in the world, and how is it affecting us today and moving forward? If we don't make changes, what might that look like versus if we did make changes, what would that look like? And utilizing here and now moment to really take advantage of being grateful for the opportunity to explore some new and exciting ways to work a recovery program. And the transitional summary will help wrap up or close the session. So this might be where the counselor is saying, hey, we've got approximately 10 minutes left. I want to make sure that we're working towards our next steps and able to close today in a way that feels comfortable for you. How would you like to best use these 10 minutes? So disengagement traps. Communication is very important and discommunication is also just as important. So when we're looking at disengagement, there are things that might happen in our communication, whether that be verbal or nonverbal, that we might not be aware that can create some tension or disengagement. Some of these aspects of disengagement traps are determined by motivational interviewing, including the following, the assessment trap, the expert trap, premature focus trap, labeling trap, blaming trap, and the chat trap. All of these traps can be very significant and rupture the therapeutic alliance. The assessment trap exists when a counselor continues to engage in assessment and might be missing important information that the client's trying to share. And when the assessment is ongoing as we know it to be, it must be intentional and meaningful. So we want to build on that. We want to be able to gather information to help make informed decisions about the treatment episode and treatment needs. If we're always in the assessment role, we're starting to miss doing the actual work and implementing strategies that are evidence-based, implementing techniques that are intentional and meaningful to the purpose of the treatment session and the client's goals. So think about this. If you find yourself constantly wearing the why hat. 
Why does the client present this way? Why are they behaving this way? Why haven't they changed yet? Why is this even important to them? If that's the only hat that you're wearing in session, you're trapped. Try on the how hat. How can I help engage them in a process of change? How can I help them to better connect to themselves and the supports around them? How can I best support them in this moment? And the next trap is the expert trap, and it's just that. The role of the therapist is not to be the expert, but to guide the client through the process of change. Think about you in that rowboat with your client. If you're the only one paddling and choosing the direction and acting as a tour guide, and the client doesn't have much autonomy or say in their own treatment, then you're trapped in that expert role. Get the client back in the driver's seat. The trick to this trap, though, it can feel pretty nice. It's a nice stroke to our ego when someone thinks we're an authority or an expert on something. If you're finding you're trapped here often, go seek supervision. Staying in that expert trap creates disengagement and causes people to withdraw. It also stifles autonomy and can keep keep people stuck in that pattern of feeling like they're not responsible for their own change process. The premature focus trap is jumping too far ahead. You might see this if you're coming into session with an agenda of how you want the client to move forward, but maybe they don't have the same goal or direction in mind. So when we talk about stages of change, assessing for where a client is and providing treatment interventions in accordance of where they're at, we want to be sure to be doing that in a meaningful way. Otherwise, if counselors are prematurely focused on a larger picture, we could be missing some fundamental pieces of the here and now that will help to evoke change in the client's overall recovery process. And the labeling trap. Mislabeling items um, that happen can be really confusing and frustrating for people. Sometimes they don't have the ability to identify their feelings or to have language patterns that make a lot of sense in early recovery process. So we don't want to be the one labeling things or feelings for individuals. We really want to help evoke change and help evoke their own language, help them to create their own labels for something. We'll elicit a response from the individual about what they're experiencing saying. And then we don't want to engage in blame. Historically, addiction counseling is a deficit counseling perspective that we must counteract in our contemporary approach to addiction treatment. So we want to avoid blaming individuals. We want to avoid allowing people to blame themselves. We want to explore what happened, how to make changes, and what has been an exception to the rule, what's the solution, really helping a client to learn from past experiences. And lastly, the chat trap. Novice counselors tend to find themselves in the chat trap early and often because they might not know where to go or how directive to be in the session with the individual. You're in that rowboat with your client sort of circling around the same spot in the water because it seems safe, but you're missing the point of exploring the sea. So we want to get, we don't want to get caught up in the day-to-day weather or sports or something that's entertaining to individuals. We can go there for a moment, but no longer than a moment. It gets to be very unproductive over time. And another chat trap will happen um, is with long-term clients that you've gotten to know extremely well in the boundary level. And they might be starting, um, the boundaries might start to get blurred a little bit. So these people might want to talk to you about your family and your experience and what's been happening in your day. So just be mindful of these disengagement traps and if and when they do pop up and how it can create ruptures to the therapeutic alliance. You can also unintentionally be setting norms within the relationship that can cause the relationship to overall just be unproductive over time. So ruptures to the therapeutic alliance can also include sympathy versus empathy. We know that sympathy drives disengagement and empathy drives connection. We want to avoid the gasp and awe when individuals are telling us a story. Our response should not be, oh my, I can't believe that happened to you. Tell me what that was like. You know, the gasp and awe can really cause people to hold back what they're feeling and start to share with us differently because they want to make sure that we're okay. And the mighty fall just taps back into deficit thinking. In the mighty fall, this is a scenario where we might place people on a pedestal. And when that client stumbles in their change process, we can't help them because we're so let down by their imperfect humanness. And if you're feeling disappointed in a client, this might be a mighty fall. If something didn't go as well as you thought and your response is, I can't believe that's what's happening, or I never expected that from you. When I think of you, I don't think of you as the kind of person that this happens to or the kind of person that does that. That's starting into some shame language, right? What were you thinking? That's the mighty fall. 
So in a sense, reinforcing some negativity and some horrible situations that people go through and putting ownership and blame on them. Then there's the block and tackle. This might be where somebody is uncomfortable with vulnerability and the counselor's response is, how could you allow this to happen? What were you thinking? You know, those things are not okay. It's not person-centered approach and it's very judgmental. So we have to be careful about how we engage in the language that we do. And then there's the boots and shovel. And this counselor, um, this is a counselor who's going to refuse to acknowledge that mistakes have been made and things didn't go as well as planned. So maybe think about toxic positivity here. This is the counselor who says, that's not as bad as you think. Look on the bright side. It can't be that bad. You're going through some really fantastic things right now too. Let's focus on that instead of this. And that counselor will start to minimize what a person's experiencing by trying to save them and shovel them out and rescue them. This can be an enabling position that we want to avoid. And the last one here is the one-upper. This is the counselor who said, you know, if you think that's bad, listen to this. And in a sense is potentially trying to help that person make feel better. But again, we're minimizing, we're distracting. The intent becomes ours and not the client's. And the client's not getting to share in a safe manner what they need to. So be mindful of these ruptures with these, with the therapeutic alliance. I think that you'll find that you might experience these in your personal communications and it might spill over into your professional world. So check in with your values, check in with your response system and explore ways to avoid this in the counseling session to avoid disengagement. Breakdown in the therapeutic alliance. If a rupture in the therapeutic alliance occurs, It can be defined as a tension or a breakdown in collaborative relationship between patient and therapist. Factors contributing to difficulties in the therapeutic relationship include failing to engage and connect with the client, failure to consider the client's stage of change, and adequately assessing the client's needs for goals for treatment. So we go back to this first factor, contributing to difficulties in the therapeutic alliance, such as failing to engage and connect. We can see how those earlier disengagement traps and ruptures can come into play that would disrupt engagement. And really the root of connection could be damaged when we engage in those types of ruptures. Failing to consider the client stage of change. We know that it's important to assess where a client is at in their stage of change. And I would do a peer and self check-in about that. Teach your clients about stages of change, arm them with the information that we're using to assess their progress, get on the same page with speaking the same language, then have the conversation, I see you as being in this stage of change, and I'm wondering where you think you are. You could even incorporate this into a group therapy session and have people anonymously check stages one through five for each individual in the room and have them engaging in peer evaluation of their own process. We then discuss results openly and say, Joe, four out of five people in this room think you're in the contemplation stage of change. However, you identified yourself as the action stage. What do you think about that? So we can really have some strong relationships and engaged conversations around stages of change. It's also very important for us to be mindful that most people come into addiction treatment in pre-contemplation or contemplation stages of change. Most treatment programs jump into action stage interventions, and that can create disengagement in behaviors and clients that look like resistance, or maybe it comes out in high no-show rates or client attrition rates. So we want to be mindful of continuing to assess for stage of change on a consistent and regular basis. As far as adequately assessing the client's needs and goals for treatment, if we can engage in reflecting and summarizing in a meaningful way, we should be able to avoid doing this. We want to make sure that it's a collaborative process, that we're engaging in curiosity, working to walk through a treatment process with somebody, and helping to make the goals or specific, the goals specific, realistic, and attainable. So think about SMART goals again here. But if we're too far ahead, if we're working in action stage of treatment and someone's only in pre-contemplation, our goals are not going to match. They're not going to connect and we're going to have to refocus and reevaluate and that's okay. Make sure that we're having those conversations. If we feel like something is off, it likely is. Client withdrawal or confrontation. These are two types of behaviors that indicate a rupture has occurred, and this is not the physical withdrawal from chemicals. This is withdrawing from treatment, either passively or actively. They say, hey, this isn't working. I'm not coming anymore. Or maybe they just stop coming, stop answering their phones. They ghost you. Confrontational behaviors might be explicit or implicit. Maybe they're acting out. Maybe they're being verbally abusive in some manner, or implicit is some passive aggressive behaviors that might be coming up. 
It is imperative and the responsibility of the counselor to respond to withdrawal or confrontation with tact, skill, and empathy. It will determine whether the rupture will become a breach to the alliance or whether the repair attempt will be successful. So again, making sure that we're checking in with ourselves, getting supervision, consultation, staying calm, and engaging in ORs when we're experiencing withdrawal and confrontation and ruptures. Reflections are another part of ORs, and we want to help understand the depth of the reflection. So this iceberg is always a metaphor that's used in counseling and can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. When we're talking about congruence or incongruence, what's being projected or what's really going on on the inside, here's the sense of an iceberg of what we can see up top, but there's so much going on underneath that's yet to be explored. So how far can we get with that? What's comfortable and safe for individuals? We don't want to overshoot. We want to make sure that we're not jumping ahead into those action stages when somebody's not ready yet. We want to engage in depth and breadth of understanding to support the here and now and make sure that the length of our reflection is appropriate and that we're offering a summary that's effective and intentional in the direction of that reflection. So we want not to lead, but we want to help summarize and reflect in a way that's meaningful and make our reflections engaging. This is where a counselor can skillfully talk about their experience in engaging and reflect back on what it's been like for them in the therapeutic alliance so far. And overall, our takeaways from today. Become the listener and the student and allow individuals to have a space to engage in self-exploration. If they want to be angry, allow them to be angry and partner with them. Be curious and engage in invoking that positive change. Stay out of judgment. Be client-centered. Make sure that we're using unconditional positive regard in all of our work. And here's our final discussion opportunity for this lecture. I just gave you some hints, but what else can you think of? How do you think Carl Rogers' approach fits with MI? You know, how does client-centered, how does that person-centered model fit with motivational interviewing? Finally, just try to connect to the emotion that the client's articulating. Remember, they might not be able to identify exactly what they're thinking or feeling, so let's reconnect to the emotion. How do you do this? It's a multitude of ways, but sometimes asking them to label that emotion or, you know, how would you describe it? If it were an animal, what type of animal would it be? Or my favorite is, if it was a color, what color would it be and what shape would it be and can you draw it? It can feel safer to open up to metaphor than to own a feeling. Identify first, then work on ownership later. It's amazing what clients will say and what that can mean. And you can be using metaphors such as our rowboat to explain the therapeutic alliance or to help articulate the understanding and connection to the emotion. The iceberg might come in handy there if you're talking to a client about metaphor. And with this, I just want to thank you for your time today. I hope that it's been informative for you and that you can walk away with a better understanding of ORS and the motivational interviewing process, as well as addiction counseling in general. Um, thinking about those disengagement traps and ruptures, they will continue to haunt you and follow you around as you become a counselor. So just pay attention to those. Thank you for your time, and I hope you have a really great rest of your day.